ordinarily one would simply adopt the protocol, but this is not an ordinary day. This is a very special day for all of us, not only here assembled, but who might even hear about this day. The government of the Commonwealth of the Sovereign Democratic Republic of Dominica, led by the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister, and the whole nation of Dominica, rightly today celebrate that uniquely historic event coming up on the 27th of this month. On that most significant day, with the authority of the Constitution of Dominica, on provisions enacted by the Parliament of Dominica, Dominica will constitute at its final appellate court the Caribbean Court of Justice in its appellate jurisdiction, and in your case, directly replacing the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. And that is what will transform that day into a particularly momentous milestone in the annals of the history, not only of Dominica, but of the entire Caribbean. The indigenous Amerindian people of Dominica, the Kalinagos, called Caribs by the English, had their own local final appellate jurisdiction, whatever it was. And so the spirits of the chiefs and the councils of those days must be rejoicing to see final appellate judicial decision making return to Dominica regionally. This is a day which was looked forward to earnestly by that distinguished son of Dominica, who was a juristic living legend in his time, who served in such capacities as Professor of Law, UWI, Chief Justice of Tanzania, Chief Justice of Zimbabwe, Judge of the United Kingdom Privy Council, and Chairman of the Dominica Constitution Reform Commission, the Right Honorable P. Telford Georges. He must be looking down upon us with that magical smile he had. This is a day which was called for passionately in that presidential address to the House of Assembly of Dominica in 2012 by the state president, a former university law teacher and justice of appeal of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and eminent jurist, Dr. Nicholas Liverpool. This is no simple day. When in 1759, England, later Great Britain and the United Kingdom, entered Dominica, England brought with its colonialism its own final appellate court. That was Her Majesty's Privy Council, its Judicial Committee, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, also written in as the United Kingdom Privy Council. JCPC originated as the final court of appeal for British colonies at least from 1972. And it has been from inception, if I may quote that distinguished Canadian jurist, Bora Laskin, writing in 1951, before he became Chief Justice of Canada, adopting his words and adapting them to today's circumstances. He was speaking about badges of colonialism and the Privy Council was par excellence, a badge of British colonialism. And the first time members of the Privy Council in London were required to have judicial qualifications was by an act of the UK Parliament in 1833, 
which stipulated that members of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council should hold or have held high judicial office in the United Kingdom or in the colonies. Now that year was significant because later that year, the United Kingdom Parliament passed another act concerning us in the Caribbean, this time abolishing slavery, which heralded the forward march to independence. So you could see that the British themselves were linking the Privy Council with what was going on in, among other places, the Caribbean. By a United Kingdom Act of 1876, the Law Lords of the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords, United Kingdom's final court until 2009, were made permanent judges of the UKPC. Again, you will note that 2009 in the United Kingdom was not all that far from 2005 in the Caribbean when the Caribbean Court of Justice was getting going. By what may be called an earlier independence clause in a 1931 UK Act, the very famous Statute of Westminster, 1931. No future UK Act of Parliament was going to extend or be deemed to extend to any dominion, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, etc., except expressly at the request and with the consent of such dominion. So we may call that an earlier independence clause. In 1935, though, the Privy Council propounded the dictum that the United Kingdom Parliament could repeal or disregard that clause. Their lordships did add that this was so as a matter of abstract theory and had no relation to reality. But the fact that their lordships envisaged that that clause could be repealed at all meant that the Privy Council was serving the interests of the sovereignty of the United Kingdom Parliament over what independence the Dominions thought they had. Therefore, 14 years later, Canada cut off all appeals to the Privy Council with the spirit of that 1935 dictum haunting the Canadians. And Canada made its Supreme Court, and I quote Borel asking again, in his own words, a final court of and for Canadians. Now, Prime Minister, it is as simple as that. When an independent country gets its own final court, it is getting a court finally, of and for its people. And that is what Borel Asking is writing there. <laughs> the spirit of that 1935 UK PC dictum persists to have UK PC appeals endure. In 1963, the Chief Justice of Ceylon, Sri Lanka, said in a certain decision that independence is the handmaid of the cutting off of appeals to the Privy Council. The Lordships of the Privy Council didn't mince matters with him in a case called Ibrele VR. It all depends, you see, on what eyes you are looking at the phenomenon with. If you are looking with British eyes, you see one perspective. If you are looking with eyes of an independent country, chances are you see another perspective. That is what happened again in the year 2005, when three Jamaican acts reached the Privy Council 
intended to cut off appeals to the Privy Council and to replace them with appeals to the CCG. The more things change, the more they remain the same, whether it's 1935, 1963, 2005, and that is the way it always would be with human beings. That's how we were shaped. The point then, Mr. President, is that abolishing UKPC appeals is about completing your independence. A Briton Keith Patchett, writing in 1963, he was then senior lecturer in law at the University of Sheffield in England. He became the first founding dean of the Faculty of Law, UWI, in 1971. Put it this way, and I quote, if the executive is to enjoy the independence from the United Kingdom, it is just as important that the judiciary should enjoy it too. Now, I have a good reason for quoting Bora Laskin of Canada and Keith Patchett of England. So that you do not go away with the idea that those who talk about delinking from the Privy Council and joining up with the CCG as part of completing independence is a matter for Caribbean hotheads. Nobody could be more sober than Bora Laskin. Nobody could be more sober than Keith Patchett. A people who are truly independent have dignity in themselves and they foster such dignity. Dignity carries self-esteem, self-worth, self-pride, self-confidence, self-image, self-respect. They do not harbor the self-doubt which breeds the belief that final appellate decision-making dispenses proper justice only if it comes from their previous colonial masters. And this is a point stressed by the President of the State of Dominica in 2012, delivering his presidential address to the House of Assembly by former colleague, Dr. Nicholas Liverpool. That an independent people should not be in self-doubt is particularly applicable to the Caribbean. Because, Your Excellency, the Caribbean is the home of distinguished jurists. It would take us the whole day list the people from the Caribbean who have distinguished themselves internationally. It was Caribbean jurists, not the Privy Council, who pronounced foundational doctrines of Caribbean constitutional law since independence. These are that what is supreme is not parliament, but the constitution. That the courts have a duty to review acts of parliament for alleged inconsistency with the constitution and in a proper case, strike them down as void for unconstitutionality. When that was said by the Wooden Court of Trinidad and Tobago, that court did not even have a supreme law clause, such as what Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court had in the US Constitution when he in Marshall and Marbury laid down a similar doctrine so that the wooden court had to find this in the interstices of the Constitution, not in any express provision. It was the same wooden court who told the Governor General in 1964 that he certainly might be the representative of Her Majesty, but that even he, Governor General, though he be, is not immune from suit 
barring express provision to the contrary. That is a court of true grit. We don't have to wait for the Privy Council to teach us that. Many Caribbean jurists have been sitting on the Privy Council itself. One of them is a juristic lens mentioned earlier, the Right Honorable P. Telford Georges, son of the soil of Dominica. Another is a former Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, the Right Honorable Sir Vincent Flossack of St. Lucia. Yet another is a former Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, who is now the President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the Right Honorable Sir Dennis Byron of St. Kitts and Nevis. And I mention here only a few, and only from the Eastern Caribbean. If I tried to name all from the entire Caribbean, we'd be here all day. Some Caribbeans have been sitting on the International Court of Justice, like the Honorable Just Dr. Shahabuddin of Guyana, and the Honorable Mr. Justice Patrick Robinson of Jamaica. Some Caribbeaners have presided over international judicial tribunals. The Right Honorable Sir Dennis Byron came to the CCJ from being president of the UN, that's the United Nations, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. These are people you read about, you don't see them face to face. <laughs> The Caribbean galaxy boasts numerous other eminent jurists. Dominica alone points to Dr. Nicholas Liverpool, who was an outstanding academician in Africa and in the Caribbean, and a justice of appeal before being elevated as president of the Republic of Dominica. And so Brian Aline, former Chief Justice acting of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Not to forget legal luminaries such as F.O.C. Harris, the internationally recognized legal draftsman, and Dr. Dolliver Nelson of Grenada, accepted globally as a leading authority on the law of the sea. With university law faculties and professional law schools now rooted across the Caribbean, legal scholarship will increase in the region. A case-by-case -case comparison of judicial decisions had been done by the Privy Council and those reached by Caribbean courts would not tell the whole story of the need for Caribbean countries to abolish appeals to the Privy Council. And while I'm about it, let me say this, I'm no recent convert to this. The first article I published back in 1975, the first one called for Caribbean countries to get out of the Privy Council because you can never respect yourselves if you can't settle your disputes among yourselves. It can't happen. Some comparison may, however, be useful, but I'm not going to take you through them today. I just want to say this. Often, when the Privy Council comes over as being progressive, often it is simply repeating what was said by a Caribbean judge at first instance. The Court of Appeal a judge in the Court of Appeal. You hear a lot about Pratt and the Attorney General and how the Privy Council has been revolutionizing the right to life and freedom from 
in human justice. But do you know that it was on the advice of Sir Dennis Byron, Chief Justice, and Mr. Justice Saunders, in the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, on help asked for by the Privy Council, that the Privy Council went on to say that the mandatory imposition of the death penalty is in human treatment. Do you know that? You won't read that in the books, and the Privy Council wouldn't say so. But you have to do your research, and you'll find out that that is so. Sometimes the local view in the Caribbean is better than that of the Privy Council. Sometimes, of course, yes, the Privy Council position is far better than that of the Caribbean judges in some cases. And that is not surprising. The Caribbean is not always the leader in cricket. Sometimes we're on top, sometimes we're below. That is a fact of life. And not unusually, Caribbean judges and the Privy Council have quite similar appetite on cases. They did so in correcting the error made by the Jamaican Parliament in thinking that the exception to public trials for the protection of the private lives of persons concerned therein have to do with the safety of those persons, when in fact it relates to their private affairs. But I tell you this, Your Excellency, the Privy Council is not exempt from responsibility for zigzag decision-making sometimes. The Privy Council in 1982 held that no delay in carrying out a sentence of death could make it inhuman or degrading. Right away, some Caribbean scholars objected and pointed out that that decision ought to be reversed. Next, that such a result could be produced by an ordinate delay was accepted by the Privy Council in practice. At UKPC, the Privy Council at one time, there is nothing unusual in mandatory death sentence. The Privy Council so held in a case from Singapore. When the death sentence was being imposed, not for murder, for drug trafficking, Privy Council saw nothing wrong with that. You don't believe me? <laughs> well, go and read the case on Chuan and the public prosecutor 1981 appeal cases 648. At another time, of course, the mandatory imposition of the death penalty is in the view of the Privy Council in human treatment. At one time, that penalty may not be inhuman because of a pre constitution law saving clause. Previous to that, it was not inhuman, despite such clauses. Now, if any Caribbean court, or for that matter, any court anywhere else in the third world, entered such a zigzag up and down performance, you would hear people, I don't know what they're doing. One day is this, next day is another. When the Privy Council does it, it is left to people like myself to come and point out what is going on. Another point is this. The lordships of the Privy Council themselves admit from time to time that the Privy Council is composed of, and I quote, members who are not personally familiar with conditions in the Caribbean. They concede from time to time that a judge sitting in a local constitutional environment with which he is familiar is likely to have a surer sense of what is constitutional than, I quote, not my words, a court sitting 
many miles away. So they enter this confession, which is good for the soul, from time to time. Finance, economics, and geography combine to ensure that, typically in a Caribbean society, only a very small fraction of cases in civil matters reach the Privy Council. So to indeed with constitutional matters not related to the death penalty. Therefore, access to final appellate justice at the Privy Council is limited to only the few who are privileged financially to make the crossing from Roseau to London. Access to final appellate justice should be more widely affordable to promote equality under the rule of law. On such grounds, many Caribbeaners have been calling for the establishing of a regional Caribbean final appellate court. The Organization of Commonwealth Caribbean Bar Associations did so in 1970. Showed you already others have been doing so. And the point is this then, calls for the establishing of a final Caribbean Court of Appeal were being made, as your Attorney General showed you in a manner of speaking since 1901, being made long before the Privy Council began moderating the death penalty to prevent it being in human treatment, starting in 1993. Because you may hear some people saying, it's the governments that want a final court to be able to manipulate the court and to get death penalty sentences carried out. But this has been called for, in my own case, since 1975, long before Pratt came about. Now, all that debate was going on when Dominicans were framing their independence constitution. In Dominica and at the Constitutional Conference in London, 1977. On one side was the government of the Associated State of Dominica, formed by the Dominica Labour Party, led by Premier Patrick John. On the other was the opposition, formed by the Dominica Freedom Party, led by Mary Eugenia Charles. Interesting views separated the DFP from the DLP at the conference, initially at least. But those are not relevant here today. What is both relevant and important today is this. Both sides were of one accord that the Constitution on Independence Day should provide for appeals to the Privy Council in what may be called a JCPC appeals clause, reflecting a typical UKPC appeals clause, but both sides of the conference, government and opposition, were equally of one mind that the Constitution should present rather important new features regarding that clause. Namely, that a bill to alter the clause would ordinarily require approval by a majority of the votes validly cast on a referendum on the bill. But the Premier and the opposition leader agreed by the Constitution, the requirement of referendum approval was not to apply to a bill to alter that clause in order to give effect to any agreement between Dominica and the United Kingdom concerning appeals from any court having jurisdiction in Dominica. So this clause, providing for a Dominica-UK agreement on Privy Council appeals, may be referred to as her Ladyship, the Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, 
deemed Janice Pereira referred to it, an exception provision in the amending section. Let me repeat that for you. An exception provision in the amending section. The Constitution has a similar clause with exception regarding a bill to alter the Supreme Court order. We won't spend time on that other clause this morning. Those two exception clauses have since materially been reproduced by three other Eastern Caribbean constitutions. St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Kitts and Nevis. Whatever might be the requirements for substituting CCJ for the Privy Council in Caribbean constitutions without those two Dominica-type exception clauses, the real question for Dominica at the conference and coming down to today has been whether a Dominica-UK agreement on Privy Council appeals could cater both for abolishing appeals to the Privy Council and acceding to the Caribbean Court of Justice. There was a view that this could be so. The government of Prime Minister Skerritt summoned the courage to raise the question with the UK. A positive response came from the government of the UK and for this, profound, thankful appreciation must be extended to the government of the United Kingdom. If I were a preacher, I would say, would anybody say amen to that? <laughs> well, thank you. So Dominica and the UK reached agreement in 2013. On that positive Dominica-UK agreement, the government of Prime Minister Skerritt had the Parliament of Dominica enact the Constitution of Dominica Amendment Act 2014 to substitute the Caribbean Court of Justice appellate jurisdiction for the Privy Council as the final appellate court for Dominica. Now what is then is this Caribbean Court of Justice? It has been around for some time. You have heard this morning already, it has both an original jurisdiction and an appellate jurisdiction. You have been told about the independence of the commission which appoints the judges. I'm not going to take you through all of that again. One thing I do want to say is this. When the Caribbean Court of Justice was before the Privy Council, in that Jamaican case I referred to just now, their lordships were ruling that the Jamaicans didn't get it right. I think the Privy Council got it wrong, but that's what their lordships ruled. But the point I want to make about it is this. Even in striking down those three acts, this is what the Privy Council testified. They were looking at the agreement establishing the Caribbean Court of Justice, and they were analyzing it word by word, noting the independence of the commission, observing the provisions for financing the court, through that 100 US dollar million capital fund administered by an equally independent board of trustees. And this was the bottom line verdict of the Privy Council on the Caribbean Court of Justice. Looking at all of that, this is what the Lordship said. There can be no doubt, said the Lordships, that the Caribbean Court of Justice is a court of, these are their words, not my words, a court of complete independence, 
enjoying all the advantages which a regional court could hope to enjoy. Let me read that for you one more time. The Privy Council examining the CCJ agreement and looking at the appointments made to the court so far, having regard to all relevant considerations, put it on record that the court which today Dominique is celebrating is a court of complete independence, enjoying all the advantages which a regional court could hope to enjoy. With that sort of testimony, is there any, any need for me to continue talking? I don't think so. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly wrap it up in a few more minutes. And remember, their lordships were not in love with the Caribbean countries going into the court. As a matter of fact, the very president of the Privy Council, Lord Phillips, in the year 2009, September, publicly was calling upon Caribbean countries, using his own diplomatic language, but nonetheless, calling upon all Caribbean countries. This is the president of the Privy Council. I want to get that point home, Lord Phillips. And he wasn't speaking at a private cocktail party. Speaking to the press in London. So intended to be heard all over the world. Said that Caribbean cases have been taking up an inordinate amount of time of senior British judges. And it is time that Caribbean countries get out of the Privy Council and into their own final appellate court. Now that's a hurtful thing for some of us, eh? <laughs> Waiting until we are kicked out. The performance of the CCJ, in as much as Sir Dennis has mentioned it, I too can say it. That is fully discussed in detail in the book he referred to. And I'll give him a copy later this morning so he can be sure about it. So I'm not going to take you through it. I just want to mention two cases only. We have been talking federation in the Caribbean since 1947 at the Montego Bay Conference. We recognize that we cannot make it in the world, each of us individually. Great Britain recognized that Great Britain cannot make it in the world without going into Europe. The Germans, the French, they all recognize that equally. So we've been talking Federation since 1947 in different ways, in different times. But nothing has happened in the Caribbean to bring a sense of the need for regionalism into our very sitting rooms at home. Leaving aside when the West Indies win a cricket match or so, leaving that aside. Nothing has happened to bring home the reality of regionalism to the Caribbean than the decision of the Caribbean Court of Justice in Myri and Barbados. Now what happened in that case? This young lady from Jamaica entering Barbados for the first time leaving Jamaica is stopped at the airport in Barbados. They have no reason to believe she's up to nothing good. 
but they are profiling her as a Jamaican in many more ways than one. And in that profile, they are denying her entry into the country, keeping her in a cell at the airport, strip searching her with some element of indecency and putting her on the next plane to Jamaica next morning. She goes through the procedures and gets the case before the CCJ. The Barbadians come with their best lawyers so to the Jamaicans. In the middle is the Caribbean Court of Justice. In the end, the court finds that what was done by the Barbadian authorities had no basis in law, in justice, in righteousness. And they award her what is the equivalent of Jamaican one million dollars. A million dollars is a million dollars in any currency. I could do it one now. <laughs> and for the first time, people in the Caribbean get a sense that they have a right to go to other countries and be allowed, as the court said initially, a period of some six months without having to put up a case. So the first time you you know, as a Caribbean, eh? yes, you can go to other countries too. This is the Magna Carta of Caribbean regionalism, in my view. I mentioned one other case. I'll give you a paper later when I go back. In, from, from the safety of Grenada, I'll send you the paper. <laughs> But I take one other case. A former minister in Belize is being sued by the Attorney General of Belize. The Attorney General is alleging that the former minister had given away state lands corruptly. The question is whether you could bring a civil suit in this situation. We know you can bring criminal proceedings. They did against a former prime minister of Antigua. And he was able to persuade the Court of Appeal of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court that his conviction was unsound. And I think quite rightly too indeed. So the Belizeans fit. They don't want to go criminal prosecution. They want to bring a civil suit against this former minister. Nowhere else in the Commonwealth would you find a case in which the court is allowing that sort of civil suit to proceed. So the question is whether the CCJ should allow such a civil suit to proceed. Now some of the lordships in the court think that might be opening the door to abuse for victimization and spite. But every time you have a new government, the Attorney General is going to bring some civil suit against a former minister. So some of the justices in the court think that is a little unsafe. Let's not go down there, not yet anyhow. The majority of the justices of the court, however, feel that and conclude that there is no clause in Adam's will which says that Caribbeaners can't make new law. So they're making this new law. And they're conscious that you can have abuse. So what do they do to prevent abuse? They say, you will have to prove bad faith on the part of the former minister. That's what they call Malafides. In other words, the court is showing that it is not afraid to break new ground, taking care always to put in place measures of security against abuse. 
whichever way you go. To any reasonable observer, we have in the Caribbean Court of Justice a court that will capture the spirit of the Caribbean people. With CCJ being a court of complete independence, and CCJ being arrayed by eminent jurists, and CCJ is affording wide access, coming to pass is that great expectation of the preamble to the CCJ agreement, that the CCJ will have a determinative role in the further development of Caribbean jurisprudence. As a matter of fact, Dr. Liverpool in 2012 put it this way. Of all the CARICOM institutions that we have had, and we mean no disrespect to you, Mr. Secretary General, none has so fervidly symbolized the dignity, unity, and independence of our community and our region, says Dr. Liverpool, as the Caribbean Court of Justice. That is why accession to the appellate jurisdiction of the CCJ heralds a bright new era. I have come all this way to go back to the land of my birth to say to the people, because we are talking constitution reform in Grenada, and one of the biggest items is CCJ. And I have the responsibility as chairman of that body to go around the country and try to convince people CCJ is the way to go. So when I go back home, I can say to them, if the Dominicans can do it, we can do it too. There's nothing to be afraid of. Into this bright new era we go, led here in Dominica by a government which had the courage and the vision to take the step. And so we urge, <laughs> let the highest praise go to the government of the Honorable Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt. <laughs> and so we pray in a special way, that going forward to and beyond that historic landmark, Almighty God will richly bless the government and the people of the Commonwealth of the Sovereign Democratic Republic of Dominica. Thank you very much.